Hello lovely people, I've got my Asian readers on wrap up for you all this week and spoiler alert, it's been a great reading time. <laughs> I've got six books I want to talk to you about this week. I'm going to dive into it because I have quite a lot of feelings on a lot of them and I just, I don't want this to go on too long, I need to be concise. So, I kicked off the Asian Readers on with Girls of Paper and Fire by Natasha Nagan. I picked this for the prompt that was, um, read a book recommended by an Asian. This was on C.B. Lee's uh, recommendation list. This follows Lei, who is a member of a paper cast. Um, in this world, there are paper casts who are normal humans. The cast above them are sort of like um, largely human in appearance, but they have like animal um, addition, like features. And then demon cast, who are fully um, not human demons. The demon king rules over this world. Um, Lei is taken from her home. She's taken to become one of his paper girls, who is like a courtesan who has to like serve him for a year. Um, and as you might expect from like a YA fantasy type thing, um, obviously there's a little bit more going over the surface and um, there's like some attempts to like change this state of being. Um, I haven't read a YA fantasy in a while, so I really enjoyed this because it was sort of like everything that I like about YA fantasy. Um, I really enjoyed um, getting to know the world, I found the cast system really interesting, and then when Lei enters um, the palace complex, I was really interested to see like how the palace works and that sort of thing. I think my main thing that I really liked about this is, um, in many ways, this has a lot of common tropes that you would find in YA fantasy books. Um, and tropes are not necessarily bad, they are tropes for a reason, because they tend to work well and we like them. Um, what I enjoyed about this is it had all those tropes, but also the, the focus was always sort of put onto women. So this book, while Lei is training to become a paper girl, um, a lot of the focus is on her relationship with other girls who are there. So like, there's a romantic relationship which develops, and I really enjoyed seeing that develop. It's nice to read a YA where it's a female-female relationship, because I haven't read a lot of those. Um, I'm not saying they don't exist, I'm just saying that my reading experience is small. Um, I also really enjoyed like the focus on like friendships and even the like rivalries and stuff like this and some small antagonists within this like you still get some depth to them and you still get like an understanding of like why they act the way they do rather than just like this person is horrible for no reason. Um, I enjoyed that the lens was always put onto these relationships between women and when it comes to stuff like the Demon King's involvement on here it's very clear that the Demon King is not a figure who has redeeming qualities to make you care for him and oh he's just misunderstood or anything like that. It's very clear that like the Demon King is the antagonist, this isn't like a redemption arc thing, he's a bad guy. And again, I liked that that was like, this is clear, here's where our focus is, and I just really enjoyed that. Um, so I had a really fun time with this one actually. I think I will be reading the second one when I can get my hands on it, I'm interested to see where this is going to go on next. Um, I do understand why some reviews say that it's a bit tropey and stuff like that, but also, like, that doesn't bother me. Had a fun time. Um, I followed that up with, uh, We Have Always Been Here by Samra Habib. This is Samra Habib's memoir. When it starts, she's growing up in Pakistan. Eventually, her family moved to Canada because they're part of a, um, minority sect in Pakistan and they, uh, feared for their safety, so they, um, came as refugees to Canada. And then about, um, adjusting to life in Canada and, um, realising that she's queer and then also exploring that relationship with her family and stuff like that. One of the things I really appreciated about this was like Sam was like complexity of relationship to her parents. So for example, um, during the course of this, Samra is um, put in an arranged marriage, goes through with the arranged marriage despite the fact that she doesn't want to, and then eventually dissolves the arranged marriage. And in many ways there is anger and hurt towards her parents, specifically like her mother and stuff, for like allowing that to happen the way that it did when it's something that she didn't want and didn't feel powerful, didn't have the power to communicate those things to her parents. And like that anger is entirely justified and entirely reasonable. But I also found it really interesting how she's able to, she was also able to like empathize. And she was saying at one point that like she can see that her mother wants the best course of life for her. It's just that her mother's version of the best course of life is absolutely horrendous to her. So it's, you know, like people are the products of their own upbringing. So, like, to her mother, the fact that they've managed to like 
get to Canada and are having like an okay life and then she's arranging this marriage with this person who seems quite nice and blah 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 like that's to her mother that's like ideal that's like a really good putting your daughter on the best path possible but for the daughter that's entirely constricting and actually she's happiest as she discovers when she goes through with this like realizing she's queer and unfolding that complex identity and really all of these things and it was just interesting to have that like acknowledgement that like your parents are not always necessarily doing bad things because they are bad they're doing things out of good wishes and I don't know like there was a complexity here that I really enjoyed I also really enjoyed um the latter part of this where she has sort of like come to a realization about her sexuality and then um she does a lot of work with other queer people specifically queer Muslims and um she does like a photography project with them and hears their stories and that sort of thing and that was super interesting because I like reading memoirs of people who are queer because it's so interesting to get such an understanding of like how different everyone's experiences are even if you share like the same label like the myriad of experiences that come under those labels are so different and I think it's really beneficial to like really take the time and like listen to those stories and get a better understanding that like everyone's journey is different and that sort of thing so I really enjoyed this I thought it was a good memoir after that I picked up The Gift of Rain by Tan Tuan Eng I absolutely loved this book um you know sometimes you just feel like it's the right time to read a book i felt that way about this one if i had followed my tbr through in order i shouldn't have read this one at this point but i just was like you know what i feel ready to read this book and it was so interesting so um this is set in penang in malaysia we follow philip who is uh, half chinese half english his father owns one of the big companies that is like one of the like main companies on this island um he's the rest of his siblings have a different mother so he's the only one who's half chinese um and it was really interesting how this identity affects his life so like he often feels separate from his family because of the half chinese aspect but then he also sometimes feels separate from the chinese community on the island because of the fact that he's half english and Sometimes that separation is an actual, like, yes, those feelings are entirely true to what is happening in this situation. And then sometimes he has to recognise that there are moments when he causes himself to be separated because of how he has felt in other times of his life and that maybe those are the walls that could be broken down and that sort of thing. That was a really interesting, like, navigation of identity that happened. Um, this follows Philip from when he's about 16 to becoming an adult. He becomes friends with this man called Hayato Endo, who is a Japanese man who's come to the island. He has built a little house on an island, like a tiny island that is near this guy's house. They become friends. Uh, Endo starts to teach him Akaido, which was really interesting because I don't know anything about Akaido, so it was very interesting to learn about Akaido. And as through their friendship, Philip gains more of an understanding of Japanese culture and appreciation for Japanese culture. Throughout the course of this book, World War II happens. Malaysia was occupied by Japan in World War II, and some horrendous things happened. So a little word of warning that there are moments in this which are quite um, intense, as you would expect for a book that is about occupation during World War II. Um, this obviously puts a strain on their relationship. One thing that I found really interesting about this is learning about the history of different places. So. Um, through Philip's Chinese heritage, he learns from his grandfather much more about his Chinese background, um, which was very illuminating because I don't have a great knowledge of the history of China, so that was incredibly interesting. Through Endo, he gets a better understanding of Japanese history, and then um, through the narrative of this book, I also got a better understanding of Malaysian history. So as a little, like, let's introduce someone to some history, that worked really well. I also just really enjoyed so many of the discussions that happened in this. It was, this is such a beautifully written book, just from, like, the first sentence. I was already like, this book is so beautifully written, I love it. Um, and then through the way that it explores, like, our ties to people, and um, what those what demands those make from us um, how do you go about what do you do to protect the people you love what is the right course for protecting the people you love maintaining your own standards of like honor and um, again honoring relationships with people but sometimes you get to impossible situations where it's 
actually impossible and you have to make a decision and what decisions do you make and all the ways that like we hurt each other and secrets and blah 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 I just this book did so much and it's a bit of a chunky one it takes its time in what it does I felt so immersed in where we were at I felt really immersed in these characters um, especially in Philip's journey that like the emotional growth that he goes on and like the benefits to this relationship with Endo but then also the ways that it has like massive consequences for him and those he loves I just thought it was so interesting I've learned a lot about a lot of history that I didn't know anything about I have just I just <laughs> I'm just going into that babble stage where you're just like it was really good okay um a little bit heavy at times but super great would really be interested to read other things that Tan Fan Eng has written because I just think he did it all in a way that was like so beautifully expressed yeah after that I moved on to a non-fiction book I thought the glimpse into Chinese history that I got through Tan Fan Eng's book I thought I would continue a little bit further so I then read Life and Death in Shanghai by Niang Cheng this is a autobiographical account of Niang Cheng's experience during the Chinese Cultural Revolution um, she worked for Shell. Her husband was quite high up in Shell, but after he passed, she continued to work in the company. When the Chinese Cultural Revolution came around, um, that put her as a big target. Um, she ended up being uh, taken to prison. She was kept in solitary confinement for six and a half years. Um, upon her release, she had to fight to discover what had happened to her daughter, and it turns out that her daughter was beaten to death by Red Guards. Um, as I'm sure you can tell from the sounds of it, this is a very heavy book. I would give many, many trigger warnings about this book before you go in. That said, I think it is an immensely worthwhile read. One thing that Nian Cheng manages to do really, really well is she has a very clear and concise way of passing on information to you. So um, bearing in mind that I'm coming into this with like, I, I know of the Cultural Revolution. I have like a vague, like general knowledge, but I don't know it in any, in any detail. I don't know a lot of the big players in it. What she manages to do is lay it out to you in a way that is very concise and you sort of really can follow the different factions and stuff that's happening, which I think is very admirable, especially given that like she's learning about a lot of this through um, the newspapers that she's given in solitary confinement and that sort of thing. I also have, I'm like mildly in awe of her because essentially um, her attitude when being arrested was that she has not done anything wrong as soon as you give a false confession that only opens you up to being able to having to give more false confessions because if you've already given one confession that's not true then it's incredibly easy to then make you give many confessions that are not true and you just end up spiraling downwards and being punished for things that you never did and Yang Cheng very strongly knows that she did not do anything wrong she's accused of being a British spy and of aiding um, like British intelligence and stuff like that which she did not do so um, she has the sheer perseverance oftentimes fueled by the anger and the injustice and blah blah, blah. she's just determined that she's not going to give a false confession and she sticks to her guns through six and a half years of solitary confinement which also included some actual like physical abuse and stuff like that as well as the mental and all that thing and then even when she was released at the end of that, that doesn't mean that she's suddenly scot free. She's still being surveyed and she's still like that sort of thing. But she, even when she is angry, is managing to retain control of herself. And she's constantly assessing situations and gleaning as much information from them as possible. Um, whether that's the actual like reading the newspapers that they're allowed to have and trying to make sense of what's going on in the wider world but then also um, what are the actual factions that are within her own prison like for example if she happens to praise X person who's currently being um, on the outs but there are a lot of guards who are still loyal to that person that means that she gets a little bit better treatment in her prison and stuff like that just like she's so on it i just think that this did a really great job of both um clearly laying out what went down in the cultural revolution who the different factions are what um changes to policy are based on what our reactions to things and then also her own specific journey like what she actually went through what the people she knows went through that sort of thing um i just <laughs> one of those books where I'm like this is a tough read but it is very worth it especially if you're interested in expanding your knowledge of a particular moment of history so um very good quite heavy I originally had on my TBR 
that I was going to read A Thousand Splendid Sons. Off the heels of both of those, because um, The Gift of Rain, whilst excellent and beautiful, did go into some heavy World War II stuff. Um, the <laughs> Chinese Cultural Revolution was a lot. I don't really remember this book, which is why I wanted to reread it, but I do remember that it is both exploring um, Taliban-occupied, um, I've forgotten where it is, Kabul, I think, and then also I'm fairly certain there's some domestic violence stuff that goes down in this. And to be honest with you, I just decided that it wasn't the right time because I had had two quite heavy books, so I thought I would give that one a skip. I will read it at some point, just not for this challenge. The penultimate book I want to talk about is Under the Pendulum Sun by Jeanette Ng. This was so interesting. This is like a very dark fae fantasy. So our main character, Kathy, has gone to Arcadia, which is where the fae live, because her brother Lion is there as a missionary. Um, they're very much trying to like bring the word of God to the fey lands. This is Victorian. From the cover, I thought this was going to have a slightly faster pace than it does, because the cover makes it sound like Kathy arrives in Arcadia, her brother is like sprinting back to the plate to Gethsemane, which is where they're staying, um, with the qu Queen Mab like hot on his heels and blah blah blah. That's not the pacing of this book. This book is very specifically taking a slower pace. Um, it's very emulating like a Victorian narrative style very deliberately um, and it's very building like a dark gothic creepy atmosphere. I think we got like half of the book through and I was like where are we going but also I'm enjoying it because we take a lot of time just sitting with Kathy in Gethsemane. It's like this castle that um, if sh she's protected while she's in the castle so she's sort of confined to it. Um, there's a l It's trying to figure out like there are some fae there, what's happened to the um, preacher who was there before her brother, what's happened to her brother, those sorts of things. Um, eventually her brother does arrive back and then Queen Mab is invited and it's it's less of like a, a fleeing the fae and more of like a attempting to convert the fae but you have to try and play by the fae's rules and what are those rules, etc. So I will say that this was a very slow paced book it's deliberately slow paced, it's specifically building an atmosphere, but it is quite slow paced. If you like a book that is really plot driven, you may not really enjoy this. I think the real strong point of this was like this creepy atmosphere, but also a lot of the imagery. I really like Faye that are like explicitly like outside of our rules of reality and stuff. Like play they have their own rule book, but you need to kind of figure out what that is in order to like not die. This had so many like visual descriptions that were really interesting, very dark, but very interesting. I really liked that. Um, when it comes to a character front, I actually liked Kathy as our main character. I felt like she had some really like compelling, she went on a really compelling journey. I was less interested in her brother as a figure. He's quite like laconic and um, a little like, I don't know, like stiff and blah, but like he is a pre he is like a missionary, like I get that, but also like um, their relationship plays like a big part in it. Like that's why she's like traveled to this unknown place to like make sure he's okay. And I, I didn't care so much for the relationship. So sometimes I fell down on that point. But some of the side characters were very compelling. There's like a gnome who's like the only convert to Christianity there. And he occasionally broke my heart, <laughs> which is great. Um, finally, there is like a thing in this, which I can't really talk about because it's a huge spoiler, but I have really mixed feelings on it. And essentially like I have, I think that it really fit the um, creepy dark gothic vibes. Yes, yes, yes. I have some qualms about like how it all played out but that's all I can say because huge spoilers. But um, definitely a book unlike anything I've really read before with some really cool ideas and it has made me really interested to read more Jeanette Ng just because she seems like she's gonna have such a cool brain <laughs> which is a creepy thing to say now I think about it. Finally, I'm just going to end on a short story collection that I read on my Kindle. I read Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chiang. I read this actually because I'm doing a podcast episode of it with my friend, which will not be live yet, but I will leave a link to my podcast down below so that next month you can listen to it. Um, we take it in terms to pick a topic, he picked this topic. Um, these short stories were super interesting. This is science fiction that's super rooted in like the science, hard science side of it. Um, sometimes one or two of the stories lost me slightly because we went a little bit too hard on the like um, 
hard, hard science, sciencey, sciencey, science, because I am a sweet little humanities baby. <laughs> but I think my some of my favourite stories in this were really to do with like um, seeing how far something goes. So if you take like X as your start point, and then you introduce some science into the mix and you're like well what if this and this and this happened and then like what are the repercussions for this not just like f like physically what would happen but also like what are like the moral repercussions what are like like taking it that step for further and exploring things for example there was a short story that was um sort of set in like victorian times and it was all about like golems and a lot of it was to do with like the exploitation of um working class people and attempting to alleviate that and like the snooty and then also kind of eugenics was involved it was like really interesting there was another one which was the first short story which was um about these people who were building this tower to try and get to the heavens and when they go high enough they believe they'll be able to um break through to the almighty and see see what's beyond and discover the the gifts and they've been working towards it for generations and generations and generations um and how that played out made me really think about some things so this was i <laughs> i won't go through every short story and my reaction to it i will say that i usually struggle with rating short story collections because i find some of them are hits some of them are miss they sort of average out at like three stars this was a four star collection for me because i just think the concepts are there most of the time the actual delivery of the concepts was there there were one or two that got a little bit too like listy listy science but like that's fine um i just think that it is so interesting and i i don't know another person who you're like your mind must work super interestingly that's everything i wanted to talk about for this um i'd love to hear if you have read any of these i'd love to hear your thoughts on them because i have so many thoughts and it's been really hard like condensing it down to keep this video vaguely at a reasonable length um yes also did you do the asian readers on what did you read did you have any particular highlights that you'd like to recommend that would be super great um i've had an absolutely fantastic time taking part in this and i hope you have too so i will see you next time but until then i hope you have a really lovely day